Hi. Did you know a simple reverb algorithm can make a sound like this? Morph into something altogether different, like this? I've been diving deep into the history of reverbs, from plates to tapes to halls, methods for modeling beautiful, real-sounding rooms to completely unreal spaces. To better understand these digital modeling methods, I built the Max for Live device to explore how it all works. You can download it in the link in the description below. Today I'm going to walk through how this tool works, some of the high-level history of how these modeling methods came to be, and how you can use this device to either create a simple room sound, a crazy modulating resonator, or even use this method as a starting point for you to design your own reverb. There are a lot of great videos on YouTube about reverb design. Sean Costello of Valhalla DSP and Tom Erb of the Make Noise Herbverb fame both have great videos, which I learned volumes from. Links to both in the description below as well. So while I feel like I'm standing on the shoulders of giants here, I hope I can add to what Sean, Tom, and many others have already shared. And with that, let's dive in. Way back in the 1960s, a German physicist named Manfred Schroeder developed a method to emulate the sound of a room, and his paper, Colorless Artificial Reverb, he outlined how you can use a network of all-pass filters to emulate a room sound. And admittedly, while this technique doesn't compete with some of the top reverb plugins of today, it does create a really simple and effective foundation, one which many reverb designers still leverage at the root of their designs today. So what in the world is an all-pass filter? Well, low-pass filters, which are more commonly used in music production, do what the name says. As you sweep it from right to left, it allows only the low frequencies to pass, and a high-pass filter does the opposite. So following this idea, an all-pass filter lets all frequencies pass through. So what exactly does it filter then? It actually affects the phase response to the signal. So essentially, it doesn't change how something sounds, it affects when it sounds. Here's a really simple example. I'll create a new Max for Live device and route the right channel through a basic all-pass filter, with the audio going back into Ableton. So I'll route the left channel straight through the device so the dry, unaffected signal is on the left speaker, and the affected signal will be on the right. With an all-pass filter, you're not adjusting the frequency like you would with a low-pass filter. You're adjusting the delay time and the feedback gain, more like a delay pedal. As I play the sound through the filter and slowly adjust the delay time, you can hear the signal drifting out of phase, eventually sounding like a really simple delay. If I use the feedback gain, I can direct some of the output signal back into the input, re-delaying the delayed delay sound. But we're making a reverb here, right? So how do we go from this to this? Well, Schroeder's point was that reverb is actually a collection of many delayed sounds. It's all the reflections of sound off the walls coming back to you only milliseconds later, meaning one delayed sound each second wouldn't sound like a room. You'd need hundreds or even a thousand delayed sounds in each second to emulate what's actually happening. So to do this, his idea was to use a network of these all-pass filters in a chain, kind of like a delay pedal going into a delay pedal, going into a delay pedal, then into a delay pedal, then into one more delay pedal. If you set each of those delays with a different and relatively short delay time and the feedback output going back into the front of it, you'd create a lot of delayed signals really, really quickly, emulating the sound of the reverb we'd hear in a room. The idea makes sense, but as I learned about it, I had a ton of questions, like how many all-pass filters is too many? And what if you stagger the delay times a little bit or a lot? How does the amount of feedback change the sound? So I made this Max for Live device so I could adjust all those parameters and make sense of all of it. Again, you can download it in the link in the description. The device I built allows you to control the number of filters, the delay time, the spread of the delay times across the different filters, and the feedback of the delayed sound going back into the front of the filters. And on the right, there's volume controls to adjust how loud the input and reverb signals are, and some pounding controls for the dry and wet signal as well. I'll explain this last switch here in a minute. If I open it up, I have a sub patch with a network of 10 all pass filters in series. And as I run sound through it, you can see the sound is going through only the number of filters that I specify. So, how many all-pass filters is too many? Well, Schroeder's paper actually highlights five as a sweet spot, but let's play around with it. To start, I'll just use one all-pass filter. I'm going to set the delay time to be quite long and the feedback to be just zero. I'll run a drum sample through it so you can hear what it sounds like. It sounds kind of like a simple slapback style delay. Now I'll turn up the feedback so more of the delayed sound is going back into the filter, getting delayed again. 
Now it sounds sort of like a cheap echo from like a karaoke machine or something. All right, bear with me. I'm gonna add another filter. And right away, it gets a little crazy. Since reverb is a collection of really short delay times, I'm gonna pull the delay time way back. And now it sounds almost like a small metallic space. Maybe almost like a gated reverb, a la Phil Collins. Is that a third filter? So that opens the sound up a little bit more to sound a little bit more like a room. But still really metallic with some ping and resonance. I'll add a fourth. And a fifth. Okay, so now it's sounding like a bigger room. A little less metallic, but still not ideal. But let's keep pushing the envelope. I'll add six. Seven. Eight. Nine filters. At this point, you can hear the reverb of the snare drum actually swelling up with the echo density building kind of slowly, which I think was the point that Schroeder was trying to make. I'll push it to 10 filters, which just sounds kind of nuts, but we can rein this in by pulling the delay time back even further and tightening the spread of the delays across all 10 of the filters. But even still, the echo density swells slowly in a way that sounds interesting, but just not quite how a real room would respond. So Schroeder had an important point here. If the goal is to use this technique to create something that sounds like a room, too many filters can be a bad thing. Again, he highlighted five as being the best balance. But you can still use it to make something sound really interesting. Okay, so there's another important detail here hiding behind the surface, and that's the idea of incommensurate delay times. Incommensurate being a fancy word for out of proportion or in sync with one another. Here's why that matters if you're trying to model the sound of a room. Say you had two delay pedals, one with a delay time of 100 milliseconds, another with 200 milliseconds, and two would be creating repeating sounds in sync with one another. And when that happens, rather than creating a wash of distributed sounds that are all really close together, some of the delays would actually happen at the same time. And this would make spikes in the sound that could end up sounding like, like fluttering or resonances. And it actually sounds kind of interesting. It just doesn't sound anything like a real room. So that's what this reflection switch does. When you select async, it does some math behind the scenes to offset the delay times of each filter so they aren't proportional. That way they don't stack up and create resonance. Why did I call it sync and async, you might ask? Well, it's because the word commensurate and incommensurate were too long and they kind of looked funny on the buttons, so I just chose a shorter word. Anyway, if you select sync, you can hear the flutter and resonance that can build up if the delay times aren't spaced in a way that makes them not proportional. And this is where it gets kind of interesting. So while that doesn't sound like a room or a reverb at all, it does sound kind of cool. And it's a great example of how you can use a network of all pass filters like this to make a huge spectrum of sound. If you want to use this method as a foundation for modeling a room sound, four or five filters with a delay time around 30 milliseconds, feedback gain of 0.7, does a good job of getting you into the ballpark. And you can use the async setting so the reflections aren't proportional. If you want to make some crazy resonant modulating sounds, just do pretty much anything else with the settings and it'll pretty quickly sound nothing like a real. And this is the point that I think Sean Costello was trying to make in one of his videos as well. Although this method creates a really interesting foundation for emulating a room sound, it actually takes a lot of work and coaxing and manipulation of the sound to make it sound pleasing. While I don't know the nuanced details of how his Valhalla DSP reverbs are coded, I'm pretty certain they're more complex than the simple model here. And I bet it took them quite a bit of time to fine tune it, which is also why they do sound so good. Pulling this all together, when the early pioneers of sound were trying to digitally model the sound of a room, a series of all-pass filters became a key building block in their designs. And while this array of filters does do a good job of smearing and scattering the sound, mimicking the reflection off walls, it does have some quirks too. And it can take quite a bit of work to keep the design from sounding metallic or resonant. So if you're trying to create an honest and accurate emulation of a room, it does take some work and fine tuning to get the design to do it, but it does get close. Close enough that with some additional filtering or sculpting, you can create some really great sounding reverbs. And even when it doesn't sound like a real room, it can still sound really interesting, opening the door to some non-real spaces or even pads or textures that are really captivating and inspiring. If you want to play around with an array of all-pass filters and the sounds that they can make, you can download this device from the link in the description below. 
and let me know what you think in the comments. I'm going to keep sharing my deep dive into reverb, getting into the role of comb filters play, and breaking down the designs of some other digital reverb modeling as well. So if you like this video, be sure to like and subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching and enjoy.